How can I know God exists? How can I know that God exists? Does God speak? Does God speak? What, makes what makes Christianity, Christianity unique? unique? How do I know if I'm going to heaven? Why wouldn't God, Why wouldn't save, God everyone? save everyone? How can anyone believe the Bible? Isn't it full of contradictions? Isn't it full of contradictions? Full of contradictions? Don't all religions lead to the same God? Why are there so, so many denominations? How can Christians claim Jesus is the only, the way? only way? Did Jesus really rise from the dead? How can you reconcile belief in God with science? How could a loving, loving God, God condemn people to hell? Do I need God to be what moral? What about all the hypocrites? About, how could there be a God with so much evil and suffering? What in the about world? people who've never heard of Jesus? Jesus? Wasn't Jesus just a good teacher? Isn't it all relative? Isn't it all relative? Isn't it all, Isn't it all relative? relative? So, since Easter, we've been on this series called God Questions, and we talked about, it, does God exist? Is God good? How do we have a relationship with God? And this is kind of the, the culmination. It's an ask anything, and if you've never been here before, we're just going to take your questions, and, and TJ is sending those questions to the screen and to the screen here on my iPad, and we're trying to answer them to the best of our ability, but the whole point, the underlying point of this whole series is to say your questions are welcome here. See, God's not afraid of your questions, and while I might be afraid of your questions, Zach's not afraid of your questions. <laughs> and by the way, on that same topic, God's not afraid of our doubts either. I don't know any believer, no matter how strong their faith, who hasn't gone through seasons of doubt. And so the fact is, all of that is welcome because if we, if we hide those things, if we cover them up, and we don't ask those questions, if we don't seek out answers, it's a huge mistake. But when we do... We discover there are a lot more answers than we can think of. It's not just a matter of, of us not being able to have the answers in our, of ourselves. There are so many answers that just require asking the question. Now, speaking of that, if you want to ask a question today, you can do it, as I mentioned, too late to, to send it in on the worship attendance card. If you're streaming the service, you can ask the question as part of the chat in the stream. You can also text a question, whether you're streaming or whether you're here in person, text a question to this number, 210-617-3780. 210-617-3780. Text your question, and we'll try to pull those out. But you need to understand something. We don't have these questions in advance. Some of the questions that you will be asking have maybe been asked at some time in the past. We may have answered them at other times in the past, but we don't have any of the questions in advance. But there is, a, there is an understanding that we have with TJ as he's bringing these questions forward. Number one, we're trying to answer a number of questions, not just one question that lasts the whole hour. We're trying to answer questions that we can kind of come to a, a consensus on in three to four minutes. If it's a question that takes a lot more than that, then we're going to answer those after the fact. We'll record those answers. If it's a question that is really a hot button issue, then that's another question that we would record in another time. And all of the questions, so all of the questions from 8 o'clock from 9.30, all of these questions, along with questions from Ask Anything in the past and questions that we've answered uh, separately outside of a worship service, they are all posted on a website called askanything.cc askanything.cc, and so you can go there and you'll find those answers. But the thing is, today we've probably, you may be asking some questions that we answered at 8 o'clock service. We're not going to answer those questions again. We're going to move on to something new, and then we would encourage you, go to Ask Anything. You can sort those questions. They're organized beautifully so that you can find the answers that you want, and you can get them in bite-sized kinds of responses. Make sense? Now, one more thing before we go on to the, uh, to the questions and answers. Today, we're doing care kits, and uh, it's out in the entryway. There's a table set up out there. We've got a number of, of folks who've helped to prepare many of these in advance. If you prefer, you can prepare your own, but these care kits are easy to just pick up, take with you, and keep it in your car. None of it is a perishable item. But when you encounter someone who's panhandling and you're saying to yourself, my goodness, should I give them money? Should I not give them money? You don't have to worry about that question because you can give them this. It contains a bottle of water, some, some uh, uh, peanut butter crackers. It has a gospel of John and some other things in here. But it's a great way to give them something that you know will be productive for their life and something that they can actually put to use. And so I'd encourage you, pick one or two of these up and keep them in your car. It's a great way for us to love our neighbors and to, to love when sometimes knowing what's loving can be confusing. So, do we have a first question? 
I think it's frozen. It still says 11.34. It does look like it's frozen, doesn't it? Well, but hey, if it sticks at 11.34, we got plenty of time. <laughs> I was wondering if these folks really wanted lunch. <laughs> All right, first question came up. What does the Bible say about cremation? Get this question a lot. Yeah, this is a common question. And so uh, there was a sense way back when uh, that cremation among some circles was somehow evil or wrong. Uh, here are a couple of things to keep in mind. Number one, uh, God created your body. He loves your body. And if you read 1 Corinthians 15, he's going to raise your body from dead on the last day. And you're going to be whole body and soul, spirit all together. And you're going to be living with Jesus through faith in him. And so the question becomes, okay, well, then what happens if your body gets turned into ash? If you go all the way back to the very beginning, to the first two people on earth, Adam and Eve, there is this curse that is put upon people, and it's something like this, dust you are, and to dust you will return. And so if you look at some of the great patriarchs of the Old Testament, Adam and Eve, right, uh, they're now dust. They weren't cremated, but they're dust. Moses, he wasn't cremated, but by now he's dust. Noah, he wasn't cremated, but he's dust. Are they going to be raised from the dead on the last day? Of course they are, because God created everything from dust. And so even if we return to dust, we can be put back together. And so is cremation somehow a sin? No, God made us from dust. It speeds up the process of us returning to dust a little bit. But it doesn't do anything that is somehow out of bounds according to God's will or God's word. And here's the thing, no matter if you're dust or not, even if your ashes are scattered, God can put you back together, and the promise of the resurrection is still yours. Yeah, to be eminently practical about this, it's my intention, whenever the Lord calls me home, it's going to be up to my family, right? But it's my intention to be cremated. When our son passed away, his body was cremated. And the point of all of that is that it's just a choice that you make, but you can be certain if I thought that there was something scriptural against that, that it was somehow wrong, you can bet we wouldn't be doing it. I wouldn't be doing it. We wouldn't have done it in the case of my beloved son. But the fact is, it's a choice that we can make. It's a choice you have, and there's absolutely no scriptural prohibition. Frankly, scripture doesn't address it at all. It's a matter of absolute choice. Next question. Do we struggle with demons today? If so, what's the difference between today's demons and biblical demons, if any? Uh, so let's answer the second of those two questions first. Um, Satan is Satan, his demons are his demons, and they have one goal. And their goal has been very clear uh, pretty much ever since they fell from heaven, ever since they rebelled against God, which is to destroy you. They, they, they want to drag you away from their faith. And so the demons and Satan, they all have the same goal. Now, when it comes to uh, demons today, uh, there are kind of two equal and opposite mistakes that people can make. One is to kind of find a demon under every rock, to, to look at everything and to be scared that somehow a demon is out to get you at every turn, at every corner. Uh, the other mistake is not to take them seriously at all. Uh, C.S. Lewis actually talks about this in a very famous book, if you haven't read it. It's called The Screw Tape Letters, and it's a little eerie, but this is one of the points that he makes. You either become over-fascinated with demons and think they're always on the attack, or you become under-fascinated and you go, that's not real, that's just a children's story, I don't have anything to worry about. And so just as practically as we can be, the best way to deal with Satan and his attacks is by the word and by prayer. When you have those two things in your heart and in your life, you're not giving Satan room to operate, and that's a great comfort. If you have a question, if you're struggling with that, that's one of the reasons it's good to have accountability groups and people around you. You can always certainly ask about those questions. But remember, in addition to the reality of demons and the struggles that we may face with that at certain times, the struggle, the greatest struggle we have is with that old sinful nature that lives in us. And it's constantly at war with the things that God wants us to do and the way that God wants us to live and the faith that God wants us to have. And so uh, even demons aside, there is plenty of struggle just from our old sinful nature. Next question. Reference this question in the last service, but we didn't yeah. technically answer it. When we die, do we go to sleep until Jesus return or do we go to heaven? Uh, so the scriptural testimony on this can actually be a little bit confusing. Uh, but but here's, here's kind of the way to think of uh, the way that we talk about sleep when it comes to eternity. One of the words that, that the Bible will often use is not just sleep, but also rest. 
The idea is you work really, really hard in this life. Anybody ever had a day where they had to work really, really hard? Uh, Paul actually calls this life in 2 Timothy 4 a race. And he says, I fought the good fight, I finished the race, I've kept the faith, and I'm pretty sure he was also thinking when he wrote that, and I'm exhausted. <laughs> and, and so, on the other side of this life, there lies rest. There lies peace with Jesus. And then, after that peace, after that time, as we said earlier in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, we get this great promise that we're going to be resurrected and put back together. Uh, We have an immaterial part of us, the Bible often calls that our spirit. We have the material part of us, the Bible often calls that our body. And Jesus knits that back together because that's the way that we were created. And we live with him, holy body and soul. And so the goal is not just to die so that our spirits can float off to heaven and rest. I'm sure the rest is nice. But if you read the, uh, if you read the book of Revelation, there's this great scene where uh, there are some spirits under the altar. And they have a question. And the question is this. How long, O oh Lord? They're waiting for Jesus' return even while they're resting. You know, the, the, the interesting thing about this is when we, when we encounter one of these places in Scripture where it seems to be saying two different things, that's a place where we need to, to really exercise caution and we need to pursue the answer to it because one of the things that the Scripture tells us is that God's ways are far above our ways. As the sky is above the earth, so God's ways are above our ways. Oftentimes, when the Scripture is confusing to us, it's because we simply either haven't applied enough thought to it or because no matter how much thought we apply to it, we're never going to completely understand. And so when it comes to this question of of sleep versus going to be with the Lord and present with the Lord, we need to understand that it's both. Scripture is teaching us both things, and it works perfectly even if we don't have a definitive answer for how it looks or exactly what it is. Next question. Is it okay to believe that God included the Big Bang and brought Earth through all its history, including what appears as evolution in the fossil record in the Genesis description? Okay, so a couple of things. Number one, let's back up before we actually get to evolution and before we get to things like the Big Bang. If you go back to the ancient philosophers in Greek, okay, uh, Aristotle or Plato, uh, you'll find something fascinating when it comes to what they believed about the universe. They believed that the universe was eternal. They believed that it just always was, mainly because they didn't have any answer for a time when it was not all of a sudden, we begin to get this theory of the Big Bang. And when it first came out, scientists, interestingly enough, were a little bit nervous because it began to sound like creation. Like there was a time when all of this didn't first exist. And so the Big Bang and the theory behind that actually begins to point to the fact that before there was something, there was nothing. All of this is not eternal. And so we have to reconcile in some way, shape, form, or fashion where all of this came from. And so that's worth a little bit of research and a little bit of thought. And it's also worth kind of the biggest transcendent question of all transcendent questions, which is why is there something rather than nothing? If things did explode and came into being, how exactly did that happen? And the Bible has a definitive answer to that, which is in the beginning, God. God created the heavens and the earth. Now, specifically to evolution and the fossil record, uh, there is broad agreement, doesn't matter if you're inside the faith or outside of the faith, in what is known as microevolution. In other words, people adapt and people change and things change. Uh, There are some questions as to whether or not one species can evolve into another species, and even among scientists who are not believers, uh, there is some very heady debate over that, and there are some gaps that are really difficult to struggle with. And so all of that is to say that uh, that doesn't undermine the Genesis record at all. Uh, There's still a God who has created the heavens and the earth, and he's created it with an amazing rhythm, which is worthy of our consideration, because as much as we know, there's still a whole bunch we don't. Yeah, creation is one of those unrepeatable events. So science can't speak definitively to it, and our faith doesn't tell us definitively how all of that exists. And so when it comes to to a question like this, the issue isn't, uh, again, getting to a definitive answer, though we may want it. We will believe certain things, and we'll believe that there's evidence for certain things, but this is not the heart and center question of our faith. The heart and center question of our faith is, is there a God, and is he good, and how do we have a relationship with him? And all of that comes to its comes to its focal point in Jesus. Next question. 
Did Jesus really descend into hell? Apparently, TJ's decided to do this little drill again. Yes. So uh, this is a question that we answered at the 8 o'clock service. So the answer is yes. He went there to proclaim his victory, but we're not going to answer it completely again. This is where you're reminded you can go to askanything.cc and get the answers. So thank you, TJ, for that commercial, uh, commercial <laughs> break. Next question. Why do we baptize babies but not adults? Jesus says to go into the world and baptize. Okay, so I need to do Clear some a things little up. full disclosure here. Yep, yep. Uh, someone actually showed me this question before he asked it. And he was oh, like, really? And he was going to give it to me, and I said, no, no, no put, it, put it in the offering plate. And then I texted TJ, and I said, so you've oh, got I insider, love this question. Insider I love information. this question. Yeah, and TJ texted me back, and he said, how do you know about that question? I was tempted just to say, I know all, but then I figured that'd be a bad idea. <laughs> I might have believed you. I don't know. <laughs> No, so here's the thing. Uh, we do baptize adults. In fact, just, just a couple of weekends ago, yep. uh, we had an adult baptism. Here, here's the bottom line. But it, but it yeah. usually doesn't take place. Usually no. adults are a bit more self-conscious, and they don't do it as part of a service. Sometimes, once in a while, but usually those happen after a service or on a Jubilee Sunday. Yeah, and, and so here's, here's the thing. Um, the question is not about the age. The question is this. Who needs Jesus? Now, this is Theology 101, so I'm actually going to ask for an answer. Who needs Jesus? Everyone. Doesn't matter if you're two months or 89 or 90 or 110 years, which is why baptism is for everyone. Now, you'll see that in certain tribes in the Christian church, right, uh, there are some Christians who do a lot of when adult baptisms. When you say baptisms, tribes, you mean denominations. Like different denominations, and, so yeah. and there, there are other denominations that do a lot of baby baptisms. Here's the thing. Whether you're a baby or whether you're a grown adult, uh, everyone can have faith. You know, Jesus, on Palm Sunday, he has this great line that even out of the mouths of infants, God can ordain praise. And so God can do work in the hearts of infants. That's why we baptize them. God can do work in the hearts of adults. That's why we baptize them. So if you're an adult who has not been baptized, let us extend an invitation to you. Absolutely. Jesus loves you. And you know what? He wants this gift for you. Yeah, when all is said and done, when a person comes to faith, adult, older child, uh, younger child, infant, when a person comes to faith, that is always the work of God's Spirit. It's never about something we do because we know something or we, or we decide on something. It's always that God has worked in our hearts by his spirit. So when it happens in an infant through baptism, we know that God promises to be there in the waters of baptism working in the heart of the life of that child. When it's an adult, that adult has already heard, come to believe, they ask for baptism. But understand, the power is always the same. It is always God working by the Holy Spirit to bring about that miracle of faith in someone's life. Next question. Well, this is a dandy. Mm -hmm. How do we know Job is the oldest book in the Bible, and when in the biblical timeline does his story take place? I really can't wait to hear this answer. Uh, okay, so um, the Old Testament written in Hebrew, New Testament written in Greek, and one of the things you see about all language, okay, uh, not just the English language, but all language, is that over time it changes. When was the last time anybody in here had a conversation in Shakespearean English where they were not on a stage? Anybody? Because we know that over time and over years, language changes. And so Job, uh, the language in Hebrew in the book of Job, seems to be older than even uh, the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, uh, which were written uh, traditionally, we believe, by Moses. Uh, we kind of have a general idea as to when Job may have been written, uh, probably around the time of Abraham, and we get that from comparing other linguistic records, Semitic linguistic records uh, with, with, with Job. And so that's how we get that date. Now, here's one of these things where can we nail the date, or is it possible that maybe Job was written at a different time and we just haven't figured that out? Uh, yes, it is. But according to the best evidence that we have, it was probably written around the time of Abraham. Now, um, how does his story relate to the rest of the Bible? I, I love the beginning of the book of Job. In the land of Uz, there was a man named Job. Do you know where Uz was? No, you neither does anybody else, so that's okay. <laughs> And so there are some questions that we simply can't answer. And so there is a bit of mystery to the book of Job, but according to the best linguistic evidence that we have, it seems to be that Job is the oldest book in the Bible. You, you noticed you did that rhyming thing again, right? You, you realize that? Oh, did I? Yeah, you can't help yourself, okay. can you? Uh, good. 
My contribution, what he said. <laughs> Next question. How do we know that the writers of the Bible didn't alter the Bible from what God said to write? Cool question. Yeah. So here's, here's, the, here's the great thing about uh, Scripture. Scripture is not just like God speaks from on high and I will write it down word for word. Now, there is an inspiration process that takes place. This is what Paul says to Timothy. All Scripture is God-breathed, and so God inspires these writers. But remember, they're not just writing thoughts, kind of lofty thoughts from on high. They are also writing history. Now, here's the great news about history. If you're making up history, guess what? You can go back and check out the history. Uh, there's a book that came out several years ago by a guy named Richard Bach, a great New Testament scholar called Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. It's about the Gospel of John. And one of the points that he makes in this book is that there's a whole bunch of eyewitness, almost uh, court language inside the Gospel of John. Everybody's always testifying to something. I saw this. I experienced this. We get this in 1 John 2, where John opens that which we have seen with our eyes. We testify before you today. And so not only is it coming from on high, it's also coming from what they've seen right in front of their faces. And so if it was altered, if people are making up history, there would have been a lot of people around to say, you know what, that's not actually the way that it happened. And yet people did not say that's not actually the way that it happened. Remember, these, these writings weren't just accepted by like one little congregation here or one little congregation there. Uh, by like the year 80, 90, the end of the first century, uh, these were accepted by the church universal and if the Church Universal had any questions, there were still people alive when Jesus was alive that they could go back and ask to make sure that it really happened that it's way. Like the, uh, it's like the story of the resurrection, right? And uh, the part where he says, we saw him, others saw him. There's still 500 people alive. You can go and ask them, essentially, is what he says. And so the point is that, that these people faithfully recorded what they believe God led them to write. But, but just practically think about this. If you are a faithful per person through whom God is speaking, and he gives you something to write. Are you really going to do your own thing? I mean, are you really going to change it because you like it better? Or are you going to have such awe for this God who is revealing these things to you that you're going to write down what he said, whether you like it or not? When it comes to, to preaching and teaching, we cover a lot of things over the course of a year. And sometimes I love what we're talking about. And honestly, sometimes... I'd really rather not talk about it. But it's the whole counsel of God, and faithfulness requires that we proclaim the whole counsel of God. I trust that the, that the writers of Scripture are far and above more faithful than I will ever be. Next question. How do you know when God is calling you to the next thing? Yeah. This is a great question. So uh, these are three CSs that I learned a long time ago. Uh, this may be helpful to you. Uh, first, consult Scripture, okay? Uh, let's say that God is calling you to, like, a new job, and the new job involves you doing all sorts of things that are ethical and illegal. Open the book and go, oh, yeah, I really shouldn't steal, or oh, yeah, I really shouldn't lie, or oh, yeah, I really shouldn't get myself into a position where it's like I'm just making more money, but I'm not really making a contribution to anything. I'm just being greedy and self-centered and working in an environment that has all sorts of problems in it. And so consult Scripture. If Scripture gives you a no, you know the answer. The answer is no. That's the first CS, consult Scripture. Uh, second CS, common sense. Use your brain. It's okay. God, God gave it to you. Okay? Back to the job example. If you get a job offer and you have a family and the job offer is going to pay you $12,000 a year, but it's something you've always wanted to do, just pause, think, and go, you know what, that could be a possibility when I was like young and single, maybe if I have a couple of kids, maybe I need a, a little bit more than that, or maybe we can't get by on that, but work through all those common sense issues in your head and in your mind. Okay, third CS, the council of the saints. And that's just kind of a fancy way of saying this. We're all saints, okay? Anyone who believes in Jesus is a saint. So that basically means talk to other people. 
If you talk to all sorts of friends and all sorts of family members and they're saying, wait, hold on, you may want to think about this just a little differently, then maybe you want to think about this a little bit differently. And so you use wisdom that comes through other people, wisdom that, you know, comes in your brain that God has given you, and wisdom from God's Word. You know, when, when, we, when we go through different seasons of life, God is always moving us into different things. And, and one of the things that happens oftentimes when, we, when we're, God's preparing us to move to something else is He creates a sense of, of unrest. He creates a sense that, that there's something going on. We don't always know what's happening. But if we employ the CSs that Zach was talking about, it helps lead us to better clarity. It helps lead us to, to have an understanding. And sometimes it requires taking a leap of faith. You know, it's interesting. One of the things that often happens that when, when people are trying to sort out whether God's leading them to the next thing is that they're looking for God's will. And so one thing that I would add to the three CSs that Zach had is this whole idea that Scripture tells us what God's will for us is in at least one place. Remember we talked about this recently? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. What's it say? 16, 17, 18. Rejoice always. Pray continually. This is, this is cooperative time. <laughs> and give thanks in all situations because this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So one of the things that I think is critically important when we're trying to ascertain whether God's moving us on to something new or whether we're supposed to stay or whether we're supposed to engage in a new way is not to get into this whole negative, frustrated, sort of, sort of uh, uh, irritated kind of mentality where we're looking for something because we're in a bad mood. We need to be people who are rejoicing and giving thanks and praying continually and trusting that that is God's will for us, not only because he wants us to be happy, but because in our gratitude and in our prayer and in our thanksgiving, he wants to lead us. So if you're trying to figure out what the next thing is, do the three CSs that Pastor Zach mentioned and make sure that you're doing them in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 way. Next question. Is the Bible literal, figurative, or both? And if both, how do we decipher each story? They're asking for a little her hermeneutics lesson, yeah. Zach. Yeah, all right. So answer to question number one, both. Answer to question number two, how in the world do you figure out which is which? Actually, the text nine times out of ten will tell you. Uh, for example, Jesus has these things in the New Testament he calls parables. Now, Jesus has an interesting way to set up a parable. You may have noticed this before. He always begins by saying the kingdom of God is like. And then he tells a story about like a woman who is looking for a lost coin or a shepherd who's looking for a lost sheep or a good Samaritan or a couple of sons or whatever the case may be, uh, you know because Jesus tells you, okay, this is not meant to be like something that happened literally in history, but it is meant to teach you a truth about the way that things work in the kingdom of God. So it's, it's figurative language meant to teach a very literal lesson in a lot of ways. Uh, there are other pieces of literature, and again, this is pretty clear, uh, known as apocryphal literature. You think of the book of Ezekiel, or you think of the prophet Zechariah, or you think of the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible. Parts of Daniel. Uh, you will notice uh, parts of Daniel. You will notice in, in these particular apocryphal books, by the word apocryphal, uh, simply means there's, there's kind of an unveiling that's going on here, okay? Uh, so you're getting a revelation of something. You will notice that in these kinds of works, uh, there's lots of just flat out weird stuff. And so if all of a sudden, if you're seeing red Theological horses, term, weird yes, stuff. weird stuff, okay? If you're seeing red horses and things with lots of eyes and women like in Zechariah flying out of the sky with baskets, you may go, oh, I think that maybe this literature isn't meant to be taken literally. It is a vision that is meant to teach me another transcendent truth about the way that things work in God's kingdom. Good answer. <laughs> Thank you. Next question. Ooh. And you know what? This has got to be our last one. All of a sudden, the time is up. Can you stick around for one more? Yes. This is a dandy. Is there an unforgivable sin? Can you lose your salvation? So they want a twofer here. Yeah, I know. So let's talk about is there an unforgivable sin? Okay, so I actually referenced this verse a little bit earlier, and I didn't read the second part of it, but I really love what Jesus uh, says here. The idea of an unforgivable sin comes from Mark chapter 3, where Jesus says, Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of men, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. 
Now, there's a mistake in the way that a lot of us read this, okay? Jesus begins by saying, truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of men. Okay, how many does the word all include? (laughs) All, okay? All. Jesus is clear. So, is there a sin that somehow is not included in God's forgiveness? Let's just be real clear here. No. And whatever blasphemies they utter. Now, here's usually the way that we read this, okay? We usually read this as an accept. Except if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, then you're done. Jesus doesn't say accept. He says but. And there is a difference between the two. A little bit of grammar. This is a disjunctive word. And disjunctive basically means it cuts something off. And so it's not like there's an unforgivable sin. Here's another way to think about it. There's a disforgivable sin, which basically means that you stand up and you say, I disallow and I disavow God's forgiveness. Yes, I could say all sorts of terrible things about the Holy Spirit, but I don't want God to forgive me for that. And so, God, go away. I'm not interested in you. Uh, To which God will say, if you don't want my forgiveness, I'm not going to force it on you. But even for that, if you ever change, if you ever turn, if you ever repent, I am right there for you. This is not an exception to God's forgiveness. This is when someone says, no. To God's forgiveness. Yeah, let me cut back to the before the whole disjunctive dissertation. (laughs) Is there an unforgivable sin? The only thing that is unforgivable is refusing to believe in Jesus. It's called blaspheming the Holy Spirit because the work of the Holy Spirit is to testify that Jesus is the Christ, to give testimony to the fact that He died on the cross for us. And when we blaspheme the Holy Spirit, it means we say the Holy Spirit's a liar. It's not true. It didn't happen. And so if you think about it, 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 it's only reasonable to understand that that the only thing that prevents us from forgiveness in God's eyes, because remember, all of us, no matter who we are, we all have sin, sin that we inherit and sins that we commit, but every one of us needs forgiveness as we stand before God. And the only person who will not be forgiven is the person who refuses to believe in Jesus. One word answer to that next question, can you lose your salvation? If you're worried about it, don't worry about it. You haven't lost it. You better explain what that means. Um, The idea is this. If you're worried that somehow you've fallen away from God, uh, people who fall away from God aren't worried that they've fallen away from God. They've said no. They've turned their back. They're done. They want to walk away. If you're somehow worried that maybe your faith isn't strong enough or your faith is a little weak or you got doubts, that's exactly the kind of faith that God always works with. Jesus doesn't work with perfect faith. He works with your faith. And that's a great blessing. That kind of leads to the very last question that, yeah. that's here. I love this. This will be short. Does God have a favorite person? Yep. He sure does. You. You are his favorite person. He loved you enough to send his son to die for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thanks for this day and for the chance to be together around word and sacrament to sing your praises and to focus on your word and answer questions from your word. Lord, be with us as we go forward into this week. Allow us to be stronger for the time we've spent together, trusting you and shining like stars. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, dear friends, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. And as you leave this place... Go into the world and shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the message of life.